Now, carefully arranging your used towels isn't the best thing to do in a hotel. You're just not helping. The general rule is, dump them somewhere like the bathroom floor or in the bathtub. Then the staff can see that they need to change the towels. If you keep them all nice and folded, the staff may just get it wrong and leave them as they are, thinking that they're still fresh. You're on a low-budget trip and you brought along some appliances, so you can cook right there in the hotel. Not a big deal. But if there's only one outlet and you want to boil some eggs in your electric kettle, maybe don't. First, you never know what capacity the outlet has. It might even set off the hotel's fire alarm. Just stick to sandwiches or something. Of course, you can boil water for some ramen noodles, but if you feel like a slice of fresh, crusty toast, never try to make it with an iron. (laughs) Sounds crazy, but some people have even tried heating up their frozen pizza with a hairdryer. What happened? They ended up having to go look for another hotel and an actual restaurant. Always look for hotels that include breakfast. It's usually way more expensive to have breakfast at a nearby restaurant. Plus, you most likely wouldn't know where to go. Much better to hit the hotel's breakfast buffet. Coffee, cheese, ham, toast, fruit. If you play your cards right, you'd be too full for lunch. Sometimes your hotel room's way bigger than you expected. If there are two beds, but you're traveling alone, maybe don't use both of them. That'll just add a bunch of unnecessary work for the hotel staff. Even though room service includes cleaning, it's polite to do some basic tidying up yourself before you leave. Pick up any paper lying around. Wipe up that coffee you spilled on the floor. Don't make the bed, though. The staff's going to replace the sheets no matter what. Plus, if you make the bed right after you get up, you're just actually creating a lovely dark environment for tiny dust mites. Yeah, bugs might be a real issue. Even the best hotels with the best staff can be powerless against those little guys. Put your luggage in the bathtub first. It's the cleanest place in the room. Then check the place over for bugs. If you don't see any, start unpacking. So, no bugs. But what about mold? The most common way for mold to get into a hotel room is if you chuck your wet towel on the bed and go out for the day. You might get back to an interesting smelling room. If you're going to be traveling a lot and plan on using the same hotel chain more than once, don't try to trick the hotel into thinking you never drank that soda from the minibar. Yeah, a can of soda might cost you double what you'd pay at the gas station. But you don't want to get put on the hotel's naughty list. This one sounds hilarious, but still, no one should ever be boiling their socks or any other item of clothing in the kettle that comes in the hotel room. Some hotel managers claim to have seen it happen. Just send your clothes off to the hotel's cleaning service people. If you love sleeping on a thick pillow, ask the front desk for an extra one. Don't even think about moving that cushion from the couch. Chances are, it's never really been washed. Saying thank you is always polite, but a nice tip would go down even better. It's not that polite to leave your room service tip on the last day of your stay. Different people might have been cleaning your room, so only tipping the last one is kind of unfair. If you decide to leave your tip on the very last day, leave a note along with it to make sure they share it with their co-workers. You can also tip the parking valets when you drop off and pick up your car. And in general, don't be shy. You can tip a door person, a porter. Those small tips can add up, and they'll be really grateful for any extra cash. Taking reusable items from your hotel room as a souvenir is a big no-no. Though it's okay to grab those shampoos, conditioners, lotions, soap combs, sewing kits. That stuff can save you an emergency. Leave those towels, glasses, and dishes behind for the next guest. If your room has the bathrobe of your dreams, you can always go to the front desk and ask if you can buy one. If you try to take one with you without asking for permission, chances are your credit card is going to be charged for it later. By the way, Don't dry hotel towels out on the balcony. If you end up saying goodbye to one of them just because the wind took it away, or was it some shady neighbor, you'll be the one who's going to pay for it. They're just plain white towels, but they can be pretty pricey. Don't be too shy to call down to the front desk and ask for a late checkout. It's probably not a big deal for the hotel, but it might make all the difference to you. 
hotels know you might be more likely to choose them again or leave a nice tip if they give you a few extra hours in your room. If they say no, well, at least you tried. One thing you can do to help the staff out when you leave is to air out your room. That small step is one of the most time-consuming things they have to do, and they have to clean the rooms really fast. Just leave the windows open to freshen the room up a bit. If it's really hot outside, you can even leave the air conditioning on. Just don't do both at the same time. Leave the TV remote on the desk, any cutlery on the table, and all the chairs back in their places. It'll save housekeeping a lot of time. They're already in a huge rush. Imagine cleaning hundreds of rooms every single day. Accidents can happen anywhere, and it's okay if you accidentally drop a glass and it breaks. But don't try to get away with it. Give the front desk a call. They probably won't even charge you for such a minor accident. Plus, management might think the housekeeping staff broke it, and they might make them pay for a replacement. Never turn down a chance to join your hotel's reward program. It's usually free, and you can get it after your first stay. If you travel a lot, try to choose those big chain hotels that give you bonuses every time you book. You could get bumped up to a suite, get better Wi-Fi, a free gym pass, or even a free night. Beware of steamy showers. If you accidentally release all that water vapor into your room at the same time, you might trigger the hotel's fire alarm. They keep those things extra sensitive just to be on the safe side. So make sure you keep the door shut next time you steam up the place. If you're traveling with a pet, let the hotel know about it beforehand. Pet policies can differ from one hotel to another. And if you have a more unusual pet, better double-double check. It might be a pet-friendly hotel, but you probably can't show up with your pet peacock. If they say no, they'll usually be able to tell you about another hotel nearby. Trying to hide your little furry friend isn't the best idea. Dogs can be super noisy. So can cats. So can peacocks. You're going to be looking at a hefty fine if they catch you. Booking etiquette is a bit different now than it used to be. You used to have to confirm your stay at some hotels by writing them a letter. Nowadays, just make sure you have all your booking info handy on your phone. That'll make the front desk people pretty happy. If it's a big hotel, they might have hundreds of people checking in in the span of a few hours. The front desk staff are usually super busy managing guests, deliveries, events, emergencies, a random peacock running through the lobby, and so forth. Just a nugget of advice, don't disturb them for every minor question you might have. Check out that booklet that's normally hanging out on the bedside table. The answer is most likely in there. Enjoy your stay! You pull up to a hotel and see a no vacancy sign, but don't necessarily believe it. Hotels usually do this when they only have two or three rooms left. Instead, try calling the front desk to see if they have rooms. Hotel star ratings aren't always reliable, as the rating systems vary between countries. In Italy, for example, a hotel can be given five stars just for having a 24-hour reception desk, receptionists that speak three languages, and rooms that start at 16 square meters. Instead of using stars, look at ratings or reviews instead. Booking late can also get you the best deals. If your stay is not urgent, try booking a room on the day of the stay. If the hotel isn't full, you'll likely get a discount. Hotel managers reduce room rates last minute to fill them. It's also usually better to book directly with the hotel. Third-party websites are often given worse rooms or whatever is left over. Hotels are also likely to offer a reduced rate if you book directly. This is because third-party sites charge the hotel a fee. Once you're at the check-in desk, it's likely that the hotel staff already recognize you. Many hotels, especially higher-end ones, will do a little research on their guests' social media. While this seems a bit creepy, it's only so they can see who you are to make your stay more comfortable. At check-in, you'll also be given an initial key which will reset the door lock and cancel any existing keys. But make sure to be respectful to your receptionist. Sometimes they might play practical jokes on rude customers by key bombing. This is where they give you two of the initial keys. Either key resets the door, so once you use the second one, the first will no longer work. If your key has a magnetic strip on it, make sure not to put it near your cell phone or wallet. 
A strong magnet like the one in your phone can erase your card key, meaning you won't be able to get into your room. Now that you're all checked in, let's head up to your room. Make sure to have a quick scan of your doors and floor. Some hotel guests have reported tiny cameras being slipped underneath their doors. Even if the door is locked, endoscope cameras can easily slide under. The general rule is, if you can fit your finger under the door, a camera can fit too. Try covering the gap with a towel. Now, how about the room in general? If you're not happy with it, you can easily request a change. If there are other available rooms, the manager will be happy to help. Once you are settled in, you'll want to head into the bathroom to check out all those samples. But while you might think you're being sneaky by grabbing the free shampoos, hotels actually want you to take them. The items contain the hotel's logo, so you're basically giving them free (laughs) advertising if you put them in your home. The robes and towels are a different story, though. Many hotels are now adding radio frequency chips so they can track stolen items. Toothpaste is one item you probably won't find in the hotel room's bathroom. For budget hotels, it's often too expensive to order, as it's classified as a medical supply. For luxury hotels, it's the opposite. They often can't find a toothpaste manufacturer that's fancy enough to be present in their rooms. You may also notice a seemingly random phone next to the toilet. But it's actually a requirement from the AAA for hotels to receive a four-diamond rating. It does also act as a safety feature. If you slip on the wet floor or get stuck in the bathroom for some reason, you can easily call for help. While the staff clean hotel rooms frequently, disinfecting smaller ones is not on the top of their priority list. Remote controls and phones are some of the dirtiest things in a hotel room. So do yourself a favor and bring some disinfectant wipes to clean them before use. If you're thinking about putting your valuables in the safe for security, you also might want to think twice. Hotel locks use passcodes instead of locks, so there's a high chance someone in the hotel will know the master code. And who knows who else could get their hands on this information. You may also want to throw that comforter on the floor, too. While sheets may be cleaned regularly, the comforters are not. Some hotels wash them every week or so, but others don't even bother. Ew. The same, I fear, goes for your sheets. Most high-end hotels will change the sheets daily, but a lot of budget ones don't change the pillows or bedding after a guest checks out. Definitely a good idea to request fresh pillowcases when you arrive. Now you're ready to kick back on the bed and rent a movie. But don't try to be sneaky and claim you clicked on it by accident so you don't have to pay. The workers at the hotel's front desk can actually see how long you watched a movie for. So if you clicked out after a few seconds, they'll believe you, but not if you watched it till the end. Fancy a drink while you watch your movie? Make sure to check the seals on those minibar drinks. Sneaky guests often drink from the bottles and refill them with water. This way they waive the fee and you may be charged if housekeeping hasn't noticed. After a good night's sleep, you're looking for something to do on your vacation. Instead of heading to Google or TripAdvisor to find the best spots, ask the front desk. Receptionists are trained to give guests the best recommendations for local activities. While you're out, housekeeping will drop by your room, but they might not just be cleaning. Sometimes, if a staff member is tired and they have enough time, they might take a cheeky nap on the bed. When cleaning, if you've left your room in a mess, the staff will have to move your things. They'll have to touch your stuff to actually clean. So if this bothers you, either put out the Do Not Disturb sign or clean up yourself. It's also best not to drink out of that glass in the bathroom, as many glasses aren't cleaned properly. Some workers even use disinfectant or furniture polish to get the glasses looking spotless. Housekeeping also don't always vacuum your room. Staff will sometimes just pick up any big crumbs and call it a day. Make sure to be nice to the staff. Most hotel staff are willing to give out upgrades and free stuff to a friendly face. They're not required to, but a smile goes a long way. Oh, and a tip always helps. Now it's time for checkout, but you're leaving early and will miss your breakfast. If your breakfast is included in the price of your room, the staff can prepare a takeout box for you. It's best to give them a heads up the night before, though. Also, take a look at the floor on your way out. It's carpet, right? Most hotels have fully carpeted floors. This is for three main reasons. One, you're much less likely to slip on carpet than wood or stone. Two, carpets act as added soundproofing. 
and three, it's more cost-effective for the hotel as carpet is much easier and cheaper to replace. You're all prepared for your next vacation, but you get called into work last minute. Oh, a nightmare! Everything's booked, so it looks like you'll be charged that pesky last-minute cancellation fee. If you call the hotel and ask to change to a later booking date, there's a chance that when you cancel this new date, the charge will be lifted. Hotels also usually overbook themselves, as the average daily no-show rate is around 10%. This means there's a chance you won't actually get your reserved room. If you show up and there's no available rooms, chances are you'll get walked. This basically means the hotel will pay for a room at another similar hotel in the area. Most hotels also only accept credit cards as a form of payment. While it may be annoying, this is to ensure that they get their payment. Guests often use extra paid services, like the minibar, which they pay for at checkout. If your debit card doesn't have enough funds to cover the cost, the only way for the hotel to get the money is to sue you. Attorneys come for a separate fee. There's a surprising amount of items left in rooms that hotels don't want you to know about. In one hotel in Portugal, a worker even found a shark that was left behind. With no idea how it ended up there, the shark was eventually returned to its natural habitat safe and sound. Once again, be careful when you first go into the bathroom. Hotels are places where you know for sure lots of people stay every day. And not all of those places pay attention to cleanliness as much as they should. There can be bed bugs and other pests around that you won't notice until it's too late. So here's the deal. When you arrive at a hotel and open your room, don't rush to open your bags and put all your clothes onto the shelves, and especially the bed. Better place your bags into the bathtub for the time being, and go check the room for those pesky bugs. Check out all the rugs, soft furniture, cushions, and all other places that pests could live in. Only after you've done that, take your bags out of the bathtub and unpack. The bathtub is the safest place because no bugs are able to survive there. So naturally, none of them will crawl into your stuff while you're not looking. You may want to throw that comforter on the floor at once, by the way. While sheets may be cleaned regularly, the comforters are not. Some hotels wash them every week or so, but others don't even bother. Same goes for your bedding. Most high-end hotels will change the sheets daily, but a lot of budget ones don't change the pillows or bedding after a guest checks out. Definitely a good idea to request fresh pillowcases when you arrive. It's also best not to drink out of that glass in the bathroom, as many glasses aren't cleaned properly. Some workers even use disinfectant or furniture polish to get the glasses looking spotless. Ever wondered why they never use fitted sheets in hotels? They might be convenient, but they're impractical for hotel use. The sheets are changed much more often than you do it at home, and the elastic becomes worn out all too soon. Besides, it's a nightmare to store fitted sheets. They have to be of two different sizes, one for either type of bed. It's just easier to take two universal flat sheets per double bed and get on with it. Speaking of sheets, you must have noticed that bed linen and towels in hotels are almost always white. The first reason is convenience, of course. When everything is white, it's easy to wash it all together and use bleach to get rid of any possible stains. The second explanation, however, is customer experience. According to public polls, people perceive a white color as luxurious and fresh, which makes their stay more pleasant. If you see an unusually attractive wow. price for a room on a website, be careful. It might not include a mandatory resort fee. If you have an option to pay for a room in advance, you'll see the final cost at the checkout. It'll normally list the initial price you saw before booking and all the extra charges, resort fee included. If you decide to pay at the hotel though, you might be up for a surprise when you check out. So always make sure to read the fine print. You may have seen a rather weird thing in many hotels, a phone in the bathroom, especially just next to the toilet. You'd probably be surprised to know that it's an actual requirement for hotels to receive a four diamond rating from AAA. But this also makes pretty good sense. For example, if you slip and fall on the wet floor of the bathroom, a phone can be handy to call for help. Returning to bathrooms, hotels typically don't provide plungers in rooms. You see, hotels want you to have a feeling that you're the first person ever to enter the room you're staying in. 
it's a question of your comfort, which is the primary concern of any respectable hotel. And a plunger in the bathroom, according to anonymous polls, makes people think that the toilet may malfunction at some point, which doesn't help the image. If your hotel has card keys with magnetic strips, make sure you put your card key apart from your cell phone and wallet. The problem is that key cards are rewritten quite a lot, and they're designed for that process to be quick and easy. So a fairly strong magnet, like the one in your cell phone, could erase your key card, and you wouldn't be able to get inside your room. The hotel will surely provide you with a new card, but that's still inconvenient. Many hotels only accept credit cards as a form of payment, and without one, you won't be able to book a room directly or use the paid services provided by the place. Booking a room is just the first step of your stay at a hotel. During your vacation or business trip, you might use the mini bar or other paid services that you'll only have to pay for at the checkout. If your debit card doesn't have enough funds on it to cover all your expenses, the hotel has no means to get their money apart from suing you. If you pay with a credit card, however, all the additional costs go to the bank and everyone's happy. The time of check-in and check-out is fixed not to annoy you. It's done so you don't barge in onto guests who stayed in the room you've booked. And the hotel staff can clean the room and prepare it for the next guest's arrival. By the way, the check-out time is normally about 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. because hotels actually care about your well-being. They not only let you have your breakfast, but also give you some time to prepare for departure without hurry. Isn't it kind of annoying that many hotels don't have a socket near the bed? In fact, time is to blame in this case. Lots of hotels around the world were built before mobile phones and other portable devices became so popular and widespread. Back then, of course, they didn't need bedside sockets, and many of them haven't yet caught up with the times. You can avoid this issue if you stay at a hotel that's been built relatively recently. Once you're at the check-in desk, it's likely that the hotel staff already recognize you. Many hotels, especially higher-end ones, will do a little research of their guests' social media. While this seems a bit creepy, it's only so they can see who you are to make your stay more comfortable. At check-in, you'll also be given an initial key which will reset the door lock and cancel any existing keys. But make sure to be respectful to your receptionists. Sometimes, they may play practical jokes on rude customers by key bombing. This is where they give you two of the initial keys. Either key resets the door, so once you use the second one, the first will no longer work. Toothpaste is one item you probably won't find in the hotel room's bathroom. For budget hotels, it's often too expensive to order, as it's classified as a medical supply. For luxury hotels, it's the opposite. They often can't find a toothpaste manufacturer that's fancy enough to be present in their rooms. While the staff clean hotel rooms frequently, disinfecting smaller items is not on the top of their priority list. Remote controls and phones are some of the dirtiest things in a hotel room. So do yourself a favor and bring some disinfectant wipes to clean them before use. If you're thinking about putting your valuables in the safe for security, you may also want to think twice. Hotel locks use passcodes instead of locks, so there's a high chance someone in the hotel will know the master code. And who knows who else could get their hands on this information? Hotels usually overbook themselves, as the average daily no-show rate is around 10%. This means there's a chance that you won't actually get your reserved room. If you show up and there are no available rooms, chances are you'll get walked. This basically means the hotel will pay for a room at another similar hotel in the area. There's a surprising amount of items left in rooms that hotels don't want you to know about. In one hotel in Portugal, a worker even found a shark that was left behind. With no idea how it ended up there, the shark was eventually returned to its natural habitat, safe and sound. Most, if not all, hotels have fully carpeted floors, and there's a couple of very good reasons for that. First of all, it's your safety. You're far less likely to slip and fall on a carpet than on a wooden or tiled floor. Secondly, it's much more cost-effective because it's faster and cheaper to replace a spoiled carpet than change the whole flooring in a room. And finally, carpets add to the room's soundproofing, which you'll be thankful for if you have overly active neighbors. Ever wondered what a continental breakfast is and why it's called that? In fact, the name comes from the UK, 
which is a group of islands, and it means a breakfast that's served in continental Europe. It may include pastries, sliced bread with different toppings, meat, cheese, fruit juice, and hot beverages. So, why did people decide to add heels to shoes? Because they already had tongues? No. The heel invention dates back to the 10th century. And the original goal was to make horse riding more comfortable. Low heels let them fix their feet better in the stirrups to prevent slipping off. After many years, by the 17th century, shoes with heels became a fashionable trend in Europe. People wore them to show they had a horse, and this way tell everybody they were rich. Now, remember the chewing gum turbo and its unusual shape? They created such a shape to make the gum look like a track from a racing car tire. 10, 9, 8, 7. You know, space engineers didn't invent the countdown. It was created by Austrian-German-American film director Fritz Lang in 1929. One of his films included a scene with the countdown. Then NASA decided to steal it. I mean, use it. Now, you take a spaghetti spoon with big teeth. See that hole in the middle? Its purpose is not to take out pasta. Use this circle to determine how much of it one person needs. The amount of dry spaghetti that fits in the hole is one standard serving. You don't have to guess how much spaghetti to cook for three people. Measure it with the spoon. In a supermarket, you pass by a shelf with eggs and try to decide which ones are better, the white ones or the brown ones. There's practically no difference between them. The egg's color depends on the breed of the chicken. These birds produce two different color pigments. You can take eggs of any color because the nutritional components of the eggs are almost the same. So what came first, the brown egg or the white egg? Never mind. It's enough to use a small amount of toothpaste to brush your teeth, the size of a pea. But the ads show that you have to cover the entire toothbrush with paste as a marketing ploy. You see, manufacturers want you to buy a new tube faster. Now, a plane leaves white lines behind in the blue sky thanks to the condensation of carbon dioxide, steam, and burning fuel. In winter, steam comes out of your mouth. The same principle works here. It's always icy at the altitudes where planes are flying. Exhaust and hot air comes out of the turbines. When it collides with cold air, it creates thick lines of steam. Now, chef's big hats indicate their status in the kitchen. It's kind of like heels. The chef wears the tallest hat. Thanks to it, it's easy to find them in a kitchen among the staff. The number of folds on the hat means the number of ways the chef can cook eggs. Of course, modern kitchens no longer adhere to these traditions. But a hat is still a must. Thanks to it, not a single hair falls into the food, thank goodness. Doctors wear hats for the same reason, to prevent hairs from falling into the patient's soup during surgery. Well, actually, there's no surgical soup. I made that up. They install cameras in shops, banks, and hospitals to monitor everything. If something happens, you can call the police or rescuers. The camera really helps to solve a lot of problems. So, why are there no cameras on planes? The crew keeps order on the plane, but they won't be able to do anything if something serious happens. Besides, there's nowhere to run on the plane. During the flight, the cameras are useless. And after the flight, the words of the passengers work ideally instead of cameras. So if cameras do no good, then why spend money on them? Now, almost all hotels have white bed sheets. They choose this color specifically to show how high their standards of cleanliness are. The white and brighter the sheets are, the more luxurious the hotel seems. It's much easier to see dirt and stains on white linen. It's like proof that you've checked into a clean room. Ever wonder why a computer mouse is called like that? Well, in 1968, Douglas Engelbard of Stanford Research Institute introduced the computer mouse. He couldn't remember why it was called like that. The reason was probably that this little device with a wire really looks like a mouse with a tail. Gasoline looks like a rainbow in a puddle because it can't mix with water. It forms a thin membrane over it. When light reflects from it and the water at the same time, you've got a rainbow. 
Now, they make magnets shaped as horseshoe because this increases the magnetic force. Colors matter too. The blue part indicates the south pole, the red part, the north pole. The two poles work simultaneously and increase the attraction force. Now, that do not disturb sign on your hotel room door is not a requirement, but just a suggestion. Maids and staff have the right to go there if they suspect something's wrong, especially if you don't remove the sign for 24 hours. Why do clocks go to the right? The sun is the main reason. In ancient times, when people invented the sundial, the sun's shadow was moving to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. Mechanical clocks were first invented in the northern hemisphere, so it always goes right. Or as we now say, clockwise. Diamonds have such symmetrical shapes to show you their brilliance. Initially, the gems aren't so beautiful. They go through several stages of cutting and then become pieces of elegance. Most of these stones have a round shape with slightly pointed corners. Diamonds shine the brightest in this shape. So why are there two holes in the socket? The left hole is neutral, the right hole is hot, and the gap underneath is ground. Electricity needs to flow through the chain. The current flows from the hot slot passes through your phone charger, for example, and then goes through the neutral hole. Now, ever wondered what that small pocket on your jeans is for? Well, people used to wear watches on chains. A small pocket was meant for it. Now, almost no one wears such a watch, but the pocket remains. You can keep something small like a ring in there. The lollipop stick has two holes for a good reason. When they put the stick in hot syrup, the liquid flows through these holes. It helps hold the lollipop tightly on the stick when it's completely solidified. Now, the pen cap has two small holes, too. They created it so you don't suffocate if you accidentally swallow the cap. Good thing. All the same, keep the cap out of your mouth. Now, why did people start to wear a tie? That all goes back to the 17th century Europe. They invented a tie to tighten a collar. It protected soldiers from the cold wind blowing on their necks. But King Louis XIII liked this element of clothing so much, he made it a must-have accessory for royal gatherings. So why are the chopsticks connected? If they're disposable, they should be connected with a wooden clamp. It's to prove that no one used these chopsticks before you. The little fabric pieces stored in new clothes aren't actually patches. They're first test subjects before washing. You can put this cloth in the washing machine and see what happens to it. If everything is fine, you can safely wash your clothes. Now, why are the cups at parties colored red? Because it helps you quickly find your drink on the table among snacks and drinks. And all those other red cups. Here's a hint. Write your name on your cup. Also, red is considered a color that provokes action. At the psychological level, it seems the red cup is asking you, hey, drink me up! Now, they believe yellow taxis have their roots in 15th century Italy, when postal businessmen used yellow cabins for delivering mail. He wanted everyone to recognize his carts. So, different sorts of pasta are shaped differently because a specific figure fits a particular size. For example, thin and smooth pasta is perfect for light sauces and ingredients. Thick ribbed pasta, such as penne, is good for thicker sauces and vegetable stews. Now, why are lab coats white, blue, and green? Previously, they only wore white clothes, since this color was considered a symbol of cleanliness and sterility. Then, at the beginning of the 20th century, they started using green because it's easier for the doctor's eye. When a surgeon sees red for a long time during the operation, their eyes reduce sensitivity to this color. Shades of red mix, and doctors can't clearly see the nuances of the human body. But blue or green areas help refresh their vision. The eyes rest for a second, then return to red color again. If a doctor takes a look at the white coat during the operation, little green spots may appear in their eyes. You can check for yourself. Look at something red for a few minutes, then turn your gaze to a white sheet of paper. You'll see these spots of a greenish hue. So, doctors wear blue robes not to be distracted. 
Also, different hospitals may have their own rules. Robes can be of different colors according to the hierarchy. This is necessary to distinguish a doctor from a nurse or an intern. Meanwhile, hospital patients still have to wear that gown that's open in the back. Careful what's behind you! Let's face it, airports can be pretty annoying. But the most annoying thing about them is probably having to take the laptop out of your backpack and put it in a separate bin while going through the security check. But, of course, they wouldn't make us do those extra moves if there wasn't a good reason for it. Laptops are dense, and x-rays can't penetrate them, so it's easy to hide something dangerous there. If the device is out and on its own in a separate bin, it's easier for the scanners to capture something dangerous. Most airplanes are white. Is there a benefit to choosing this exact color? No, white paint doesn't make a place feel lighter. Neither does it save money on painting. Here are the actual reasons for the choice. Safety, efficiency, and comfort. The first airplanes had a metallic color, but the problem with metal is that it's prone to corrosion. So painting it is a great way to protect an airplane from corrosion. White is favored for several reasons. First, planes fly high above the clouds and are exposed to sunlight a lot. White is the color that absorbs the least heat, and white planes get heated less. Also, sunlight makes the paint fade away. A colorful airplane will have its paint fade very fast and will require repainting. And repainting is costly, so painting aircraft white is a more lasting choice. Also, any damage is more easily noticed on a white surface. So that's one more point for the white color. We always board from the left side of the plane, every single time, no exceptions. For some reason, the right side just doesn't seem to be an option. Yes, that's done on purpose. First, the captain usually sits on the left. This way, it's easier for the pilot to align the plane with the terminal jet bridge. Also, aircraft are fueled and loaded with baggage on the right side. Since people board the plane from the left, the crew can do their job undisturbed, and there's no danger to passengers. Consistency with the choice of a side helps to make everything work more effectively. Since everyone always enters from the left, all jet bridges are designed to get attached to the left side of the airplane. If every airplane had the freedom to choose the side, it would create an additional mess for the logistics behind the process. There are more questions popping up. Like, what does this black triangle drawn above one of the windows mean? Apparently, it marks the seat from which the view of the airplane's wing is the best. It's needed for the crew to find the spot as fast as possible if, in case of an emergency, they need to inspect the engines, slats, or flaps. This mark saves a lot of time. Next, the rows aren't well aligned with the windows. This is business. Originally, all planes are designed with rows and windows lining up perfectly. But when an airline buys a jet, they add some additional seats, squeezing them closer together. This way, they have more seats, which means more passengers, so they can sell more tickets. But you get less space for your legs and might miss out on a window. Also, all windows have rounded corners, and this is done for safety reasons. There used to be planes with squared windows, but those caused crashes because such windows couldn't withstand high altitude pressures. At high altitudes, external atmospheric pressure is lower than the pressure inside the cabin. So, there's a big difference in pressure inside and outside the airplane, and this creates stress. Without windows, this stress flows smoothly through the material. A squared window becomes an obstacle, and the flow of stress needs to change direction. The pressure builds up in the corners, leading to cracks. As a result, such windows break. Oval windows allow the stress to flow more smoothly, without disrupting them too much and preventing stress concentration. So, oval windows are safer. The glass used in production is stretched acrylic glass, and there are three separate panes of it. This is done as a security measure in case there is a breach. This way, at least one pane will remain intact at all times. Have you ever noticed those small holes in the windows? The tiny hole is actually only in the pane that's in the middle. Its task is to regulate the huge pressure difference inside and outside the cabin. 
This way, the outer pane can handle the load. If the outer pane breaks, the middle one, even though there's a hole in it, will be able to keep the window intact. Also, that hole prevents the windows from fogging up. Now, let's say you want to relax and watch a movie. Luckily, there's a pair of headphones, but they're weird. They have a two-pronged plug. No, this is not some kind of advanced technology. This is a witty move to prevent theft. If you can't use them anywhere else but on the airplane, no one will have the urge to snatch them away. Outside the airplane, they're basically useless. And then they bring food. There are people who love airplane food and people who aren't very fond of it. But most will agree that food does taste different in the air. Turns out it's actually a thing. Low air pressure, lack of humidity, and background noise that we have at high altitudes change the functioning of our taste buds. They become less sensitive to sweet and salty foods, so airlines have to use more seasoning. Have you ever wondered what would happen if someone opened an airplane door accidentally? This wouldn't end well. It would be very dangerous to say the least. More specifically, soon there would be a lack of oxygen in the cabin. But gladly, no one can open that door accidentally. The pressure difference between inside and outside makes it almost impossible. It would take some immense strength to open it. The doors are designed to open on their own in case of an emergency. Speaking of safety, during takeoff and landing, the crew dims the light in the cabin. This is done for a good reason. This way, in case of emergency, you will see everything more clearly. Your eyes will get used to the darkness and you'll have an easier time evacuating. Now, about pilots. They always wear those cool sunglasses, but the purpose is not to look cooler. They're used to protect the eyes. Throughout their career, pilots have to take care of their vision, but the problem is that it's not an easy task when you're a pilot. The damaging solar radiation that our sun emits is filtered out by the Earth's atmosphere, so the sunlight isn't very damaging to you if you spend most of your time on the ground. But it's different up in the sky. There's less air there and the brightness is way higher. And with every 1,000 feet of elevation, the solar radiation is around 5% stronger. On average, aircraft fly at an altitude of 35,000 feet. This means that the amount of UV radiation is 175% greater than on the ground. This is very damaging to any person's vision. The large amount of time pilots spend in the air makes them vulnerable to different eye problems. And having eye problems can cost a pilot their career. So, wearing sunglasses is a crucial thing for them, and these sunglasses must be of the best quality. They should minimize the impact of sunlight and withstand UV rays, providing 100% protection for the eyes. Also, they can't be polarized, since polarization can mess with the perception of the cockpit displays. They should provide the best clarity decrease eye fatigue, and minimize color deformation so that pilots can see just like they would without their sunglasses on. Pilots can't eat similar meals when they're working. Imagine that you're on a transoceanic flight. The airplane is flying over the Pacific Ocean. Flight attendants deliver the dinner meals. Everyone is enjoying the pasta. The sauce tastes a bit funny though. Hmm, that's probably okay. After all, you are eating an aircraft meal. It can't taste like a five-star chef plate. Time goes by. Oh no, you were right. Something was indeed wrong with the food. But if all the passengers have the same problem, so do the pilots. To prevent both of them being out of order, pilots are advised not to eat the same meal at the same time. In such a scenario, if one pilot feels bad, the other one can take over. I mean, this is not an imperative rule stated by the Federal Aviation Administration, but most airlines make their own rules about this matter. Flight attendants have access to hidden equipment, such as a defibrillator, supplemental oxygen, a fire extinguisher, and duct tape. But probably the most interesting gear they have is handcuffs. These objects are there to protect passengers from others, and sometimes from themselves. Turns out that flight attendants have everything they need to defuse a troublemaker. Aviator sunglasses look cool on pilots in movies, 
But in real life, they don't wear polarized glasses. First off, they have a glare-reducing effect. This can cause some trouble in the cockpit. A pilot has to read instruments, but the stuff in the cockpit, such as LCD displays, emits polarized light. So a pilot with those cool polarized glasses can't read the displays with 100% efficiency. Pilots shouldn't wear these glasses simply because of safety concerns. Imagine a shimmer of glare coming from another plane's windscreen, but the pilot missed the sign because of polarized sunglasses. Ever noticed a hole in the tail of an airplane? Well, most commercial airplanes have it. Next time you get into an airplane, take a closer look. The hole has a fancy name, Auxiliary Power Unit. It looks like a hole from the outside, but that is actually a hidden turbine engine. Most of the time, the APU will remain off for the entire flight. It will start working when the plane lands. It provides power to the cabin lights, air conditioning, and cockpit electronics. Don't underestimate the APU's power, though. It can also provide the power required to start the main engines. You've watched a bright side video and learned what the APU is. A perfect icebreaker. Unfortunately, you're not in a chatty mood. You just want to take the plane, land, and start your vacation. Yet again, there is only one door to board. You are at the end of a queue. Why don't planes generally have multiple doors? According to the experts, the biggest issue is that the bridge takes up a lot of space. When an aircraft is loaded from the front and the rear, it takes up two slots. This is not ideal for the administrators. Newly remodeled or constructed terminals tend to have dual boarding compared to the older terminals. Change of scenery, let's jump into a cruise ship. There are hidden passageways and secret doors in ships. These secrets are from an insider. Staff on the ship mostly work in their designated area. How does a worker get from one place to another without using the stairs and doors that the passengers use? There is a network of corridors and stairs all around the ship, used only by the crew. I mean it when I say secret doors. They blend with the walls, so they go undetected by those who don't know where the door is. Maybe you can stumble by accident. Here is a clue. Pay attention to the walls near the guest stairs. Try to think of those gigantic cruise ships as floating metals. This leads me to a cruise cabin fun fact. The walls of the cruise ship cabin are magnetic. Imagine you're traveling to multiple countries on board a cruise ship, a single month voyage. You collect destination themed magnets and decorate your cabin. True cruise fans know this magnet magic, so they put a couple of magnetic hooks into their luggage. Neat tip, use magnetic hooks to add extra storage in your cabin. Hang clothes and accessories, postcards or hats. Speaking of ships, why do some ships and boats have small holes constantly releasing water? To keep the bilge free of water. Water builds up over time inside the bilge, and the bilge pump automatically pumps the water out again. Ships don't have headlights. Using a headlight could prevent accidents. If they work for cars, why not for ships? Headlights are the source of light, but the light that comes out of them bounces back at the light source at some point. With cars, for instance, headlights work because the area you want lit is narrow, and you can easily take action if you see an obstacle on the road. For ships, this is super hard. The light source should be powerful enough to light the area the captain wants to see. Large cargo ships, for instance, need more than a mile to stop or take action. Plus, imagine how much brighter should the ship's light be to light the whole area in front of it. They do see each other with different sorts of lights called navigation lights. These are small but practical. They arrange it in a standardized way so that ships could see each other. The exciting thing is that they don't just notice one another in the dark, they also understand each other's movements and directions. Here's an example. Imagine a ship with two nav lights. The one on the front is lower, near the ship floor. The other one on the back is high up. This means the vessel goes to the right. It can safely pass by the other ships without hitting them. Trains don't have seat belts. A bit weird. Every time there is a crash related to trains, this matter comes up. Pretty much nowhere in the world seatbelts are used on trains. Various studies have been made about this issue. Some of them created simulations of accidents, and the results were surprising. Using a seatbelt on a train could potentially increase the number of injuries. In cars, seatbelts are highly effective in protecting the passenger and are used all the time. 
The logic behind the seatbelt is to protect the person when a collision causes rapid deceleration. But trains carry so much momentum that they don't stop rapidly. On a plane, passengers use a seatbelt on takeoff, during landing, and if turbulence occurs. There are no such things for trains. Entering and leaving a station is not a high risk. Experts believe focusing and making investments are other ways to improve railway safety. Now, you are traveling by train. You look outside the window. There are small stones along the railway tracks to accompany you on the journey. Those stones are formerly known as track ballast. They do a very important job. They provide support to and maintain the tracks. They're not there by mere coincidence, though. Now look at the stones closer. You can notice that there is no single smoothly cut stone on the tracks because they're not regular stones randomly poured at the rails. Each rock has sharp and abrupt edges. Sharp edges hold on to each other. They protect the railroad from harsh concussions. They facilitate water drainage in heavy rain and keep down the grass and other weeds. Now imagine replacing those with round pebbles. They will slide down. Eventually, the ballast will spread out and tracks will fall apart. The last thing you would want, especially if you were a passenger on that train. It seems strange that a commercial jet doesn't have keys to turn it on. But it's a bit more complicated than just turning a key. Instead, there's a series of buttons and dials on the control board that starts the complicated process. A battery provides the power to the aircraft that is charged through a small electric generator within the jet's tail. Airflow gets in and moves into the jet's engines to keep them cool. A reserve power then warms the turbines by turning them slowly until they start spinning at the right rate. Then, the engines can be turned on one at a time. With up to four engines on a commercial jet, this entire process can take up to 90 minutes. Planes don't have keys to lock the doors either, but when they sit idle, jets have security guards constantly monitoring them. But even if someone happened to get past them, it wouldn't be a quick getaway. When you enter the plane, the captain keeps a close eye on the boarding process. They are not only in command of the flight deck, but also of the passenger's cabin. To become a commercial pilot, you gotta have a distance vision of at least 20-20. But depending on the airline, it's sometimes okay if your perfect vision is assisted with glasses. It's time to find a seat on the plane. You checked in late, and you've already had an unpleasant experience of not getting on your flight like that in the past. This is because airlines purposely overbook their flights, just in case there are no-shows or cancellations. So, you didn't get to choose your seat this time. You walk past the front seats in jealousy. There are seats that are always taken much faster because everyone wants to leave the plane as soon as possible after it lands. But if you're choosing safety over early departure, the back is the place to be. It's estimated to be 40% safer in the rear end of the plane. Maybe you'd prefer to drive instead of flying? The chances of something dangerous happening to a plane during a flight are 1 in 11 million. Compare it to the likelihood of a car accident, which is 1 in 5,000. You've been placed at the emergency exit. Excellent! More legroom! Over the past 30 years, legroom has been decreasing more with every year. Up to 5 inches on some airlines. No, you haven't been getting taller. The reason behind this is the more people they're able to fit in, the more money the airline makes. Airlines don't build their own aircraft and use factory-made planes. From there, each airline will determine its own seating structure. This is also why the seats don't line up with the windows. But it doesn't matter, you have the best seat, although it's always a bit concerning when sitting next to an emergency door. What if you accidentally knocked it while asleep and opened it? Relax, it's actually impossible to open these doors while flying. The air pressure inside pushes against every square inch of the cabin. On the door itself, this pressure equates to 1,000 pounds across every square foot of the door. But even if you somehow developed Hulk-like strength in your sleep, you still wouldn't be able to open it as there's a series of electrical and mechanical devices that latch it closed. The extra measures are important as the moment the door opens, the entire cabin temperature would quickly drop, and that drastic change in pressure would weaken the plane's structure. It's time for takeoff, and they've asked you to turn your phone off. Should you really? 10% of people have admitted that they don't turn theirs off and don't even set them to airplane mode. 
Cell phones can cause issues, but they don't disrupt the electronics as you might believe. There is a genuine concern that while you're flying in the air, your phone can receive signals from multiple towers on the ground, providing stronger distractions for the pilots. So let's make their job a little easier and turn it off. The plane has reached 40,000 feet, your ears have popped, and the seatbelt sign is turned off. The flight attendant walks down the aisle with their arms held outward. Within such a thin passage, they walk this way as it helps with their balance. They try to avoid disrupting passengers, so they don't use the headrest of the seats. And in case of sudden turbulence, there are special grabbing spots under the overhead luggage bay. It's estimated that half a million people are flying in the sky at any given time. So right now, you're part of that special group involving 0.1% of the world's population. You look out the window and notice the white wings. Planes are painted white and other lighter colors as well to help reflect solar radiation. This avoids damage from the sun by reducing the amount of heat the plane receives. But further in the distance, dark clouds approach, and the plane is heading towards a thunderstorm. Since it's made of metal, it has to be a big electric conductor, right? Thankfully, jets are fitted with an aluminum shell that conducts electricity very well. The cabin's interior is completely shielded from lightning, protecting electrical systems and leaving us carbon-based mammals unhurt. A plane is so perfectly built for electrical storms that it's one of the safest places to be. There haven't been any major incidents from a storm since the 1960s. You're thirsty and you're aware that you should have brought your own water. When aircrafts land at each location, they refill their water supplies. The water quality in a plane is based on where they collected the vital liquid. Many things contribute to the water quality of every airport. Water cabinets, trucks, carts, and hoses all could be of different standards. In 2019, an airline water study found that most airlines weren't providing clean water, so the general recommendation is to only drink water from a sealed bottle and avoid even tea. But the food is perfectly fine. As you sit back down, you notice the cabin is cold. Super cold, to be honest. It's intentionally set to around 71 degrees Fahrenheit, for a good reason. When people become vulnerable to fainting, it's due to not receiving enough oxygen. And when there's warm air mixed with high cabin pressure, fainting becomes more common. So, while the cold air is helping those who need it, you've been provided with a blanket for your comfort. Warmed up with a blanket, you notice the dry air running through your nose, and it dehydrates your lips and eyes. But don't worry, the air is completely safe and very clean. 40% of the air is recycled and goes through a thorough cleaning system to remove all dust and airborne bacteria, and the other 60% comes from the outside. The humidity levels in the air get very low, and that's why you feel all that discomfort. It's now dark outside as the plane begins its descent to land, and the lights are dimmed. The dimmed lights aren't for the pilots or crew or those at the airport. They're for you. If something goes wrong while landing when it's dark, they'll have to start an emergency procedure. The dimmed lights are there to help your eyes adjust and help you follow towards the exit in the dark easier. But luckily, today, it won't be necessary, as your journey has come to an end. Now first, you probably already know that germs are everywhere, and it's impossible for humans to get rid of them. These tiny creatures train our immune system. We're becoming stronger when our organism constantly faces bacteria and improves its protection skills. So don't worry about what you see next. <laughs> Welcome to one of the favorite places among bacteria and microbes – hotel rooms. Yes, they seem to be so clean, but in some ways, they're more dangerous than a garbage dump. Everything is dirty at the landfill, and you're afraid to touch anything. But the dirt in hotel rooms is almost invisible. Germs are waiting for you here, and there are a lot of them. So, the first problems appear already in the elevator. The buttons on the panel are swarming with various bacteria. Suppose no one cleans them with a disinfectant. In that case, these buttons become the arena where billions of microbes multiply and devour each other. Take a look at an ordinary apartment building. 
There are elevators, too. The same people live in this house, transmitting the same germs when they touch the elevator buttons. Your body encounters these microbes often and quickly develops the needed protection. But different people stay in hotels. A guy from some African country can bring a bacterium that will be dangerous for a girl from cold Norway. Therefore, after you touch the button, wash your hands with a soap or disinfectant. So, the elevator opens its doors and you walk towards your room. Watch out! There's another hot spot ahead. See that door handle? This area is another beloved playground for germs. How many people have touched it before you? How long has it been since it was washed? Do you know why such a handle is more dangerous than a toilet seat? Most of all, microbes accumulate on our fingers and palms. When we don't wash them, we transfer a million bacteria from one place to another by touching the surfaces of different objects. So the best way is to touch the door handle with the same hand you use to press the button in the elevator. As soon as you enter the room, wash your hands. The good news is that hotel staff clean bathrooms and toilets much better than the rest of the room. So you're a bit safer here. But still, take a good look at the corners of the bathroom and the tiles. If you see black spots somewhere, it means there's mold. This thing can cause allergic reactions like runny nose and eye irritation. Mold can be pretty dangerous, but hotel staff usually watch it closely. So it's unlikely that there will be something like this in your room unless it's a cheap hotel. You don't stay there, do you? Oh, by the way, did you know that toilet paper in a public toilet contains more germs than the toilet lid? You make a mistake if you cover the seat with pieces of that paper. First, many people touch it, which means they transfer bacteria onto it. Secondly, dirty little splashes get on the roll when someone flushes the toilet. Microbes feel more comfortable living on soft paper than on the hard surfaces of the toilet. So don't put it on the seat. But if you see a metal or plastic cover on the roll, you're lucky, since the roll is protected from germs. Then, after you've done your business and washed your hands thoroughly, you have two options. Wipe your hands with a paper towel or use a hand dryer. It doesn't matter what you choose, both variants have a lot of germs. But if you use the dryer, bacteria will fly all over the room. So better grab a towel. Okay, you come out of the bathroom and find yourself in a danger zone. Don't think that all germs there are harmless. Some of the most common bacteria in hotels cause intestinal infections. If you don't want to spend the rest of your vacation or business trip next to or on the toilet, get ready to fight colonies of tiny parasites. The first thing you need to do is wash those glasses and cups with soap. Some travelers carry their own mugs with them, which is a good idea. Then look around and ask yourself, which places do people touch the most? These are the TV remote control, coffee machine, fridge, door handles, tables, hair dryer, and windows. But relax, you don't need to do the cleaning instead of the hotel staff. It's enough to have wet wipes with a powerful disinfectant. Wipe the surface of all these objects. Perhaps you worry in vain, and the hotel carefully monitors how clean the rooms are. <laughs> or you can tell the manager you want to have your room cleaned again. So, you've wiped all the surfaces and jumped into bed tired. Unfortunately, you're not the only one to rest on that soft mattress. You have a huge company of bacteria. Of course, washing pillowcases and bed linen destroys germs, but what about the bedspread? Most likely, nobody washes it. Removing germs from the tissue is difficult, so you'll probably have to put up with it. But the thing you shouldn't accept is bed bugs. If you notice dark spots on your mattress, this is most likely the waste left by bed bugs. You're not hungry, are you? I don't want to spoil your appetite. The insects themselves can hide deep in the mattress. They can sleep there for months and then wake up to satisfy their hunger. While you're resting, they come out and bite your legs. If you notice small red spots on your skin in the morning, then bed bugs have, well, kissed you. The bites of these beetles are not dangerous. Some people may have a mild allergic reaction in the form of irritation on the skin. But the problem is that some bed bugs can get into your clothes or things. Then you'll bring them home. These creatures multiply rapidly. Therefore, if you don't want a colony of biting bugs in your house, 
then wash your clothes, clean your luggage, and go to the shower. But before that, ask the hotel manager to refund your money because bed bugs are unex. By the way, even if the room is squeaky clean, it doesn't mean there are no bed bugs in it. Perhaps previous guests brought them. So your bed has no black spots and you have wiped all the dangerous surfaces. That's it, you're safe. But try to walk on the floor wearing slippers or thick socks, as the floor is also a source of dirt. You spend several nights in the hotel and finally return to a clean and safe place, your home. Unfortunately, your house can also have many germs you don't see. Do you like to have fun with friends and play video games? Do you remember when the last time you cleaned the gamepad was? All your friends have held it in their hands, which means you've collected all of their microbes there. Your kitchen cutting board. How thoroughly do you wash it? It's not enough just to splash it with water, especially if you cut meat and vegetables. You can cut some squash, and its germs will stick to the surface. Then you quickly wash the board and put it back in place. But the germs haven't gone away. They're still firmly attached to the surface, waiting for you to cut bread. Then they'll jump onto the food and get into your stomach. Uh, how's that appetite doing? Still good? Another dangerous place is a dish sponge. Even if you use a good detergent, germs still accumulate there. The best way to get rid of them is to change sponges once a week. And now you'll see a paradise for bacteria. A place with an ideal cold temperature and a lot of food, from fresh to spoiled. Hey, it's your fridge! There you put products that you bring from the supermarket. Hundreds of people could touch them with their hands, leaving millions of germs. Therefore, don't forget to wash your fridge often. And also, keep any meat away from packaged products, because germs on a rare steak multiply and spoil it quickly. Well, perhaps you're too worried about your health now. If so, then you should remember the words from the beginning of the video. Let me quote. You probably already know that Germans are everywhere. Wait, that's not it. Ah, uh, sorry. You check into your hotel room, connect to Wi-Fi, jump on the bed, and post 15 photos of your new window view. When the initial surge of excitement is gone, you notice a suspicious blinking light on your big TV. Could it be that someone is watching you? Or have you just seen too many spy movies? Well, hidden cameras come in all shapes and sizes. Large ones are easy to spot, but the small ones can be really sneaky and inconspicuous. They can be hiding behind furniture, in decorations, or vents, and anywhere else you'll have trouble noticing. There are even special cameras that can be hidden in everyday movable objects, like alarm clocks, picture frames, vases, and lamps. Check to see if these objects are facing at a strange angle, or if they're positioned to get the best view of your room or bathroom. The easiest way to spot a hidden cam is to look for the lens reflection, because all cameras come with lenses. Turn off the lights and slowly scan the room with a flashlight, laser pointer, or a special wireless spy cam detector. It comes with infrared scanning lights and one illuminating light. When you find a reflective red spot, you gotta turn on the flashlight to help check if there is a hidden camera. Definitely check the vents along with any other holes and gaps in the walls or ceiling. Some advanced detectors even show you what the camera is seeing, making it way easier to spot and disable. The detectors only work on cameras that are turned on and working normally, though. Your mobile phone can also help you find some hidden threats. Turn on Bluetooth and walk around. See if any unknown devices pop up on the screen. Another idea is to install a network scanner app that shows all devices that are connected to the Wi-Fi network you're using at the hotel. When it's done scanning, study the list for devices called something like IP camera or cam. Plus, you can put your phone on selfie mode, turn off the light and close the curtains, and look around the room slowly while focusing on the screen. Keep an eye out for purple or white lights on the screen. You can play detective some more and call your friend or family member and start walking around your room. Secret cameras should emit a sort of radio frequency. It will most likely interfere with your phone call signal. 
If you start hearing any weird noises while you're on the phone in a certain area of your room, make sure to inspect it carefully. Check out the light switches, electrical outlets, lamps, and other objects you normally wouldn't pay attention to. If they look a bit crooked, have a hole, or seem misplaced, it could be a sign that someone tampered with them. Many spy devices need wires, and whoever installed them had to hide those wires, often behind the vinyl baseboard. That's why the place where the floor and the wall meet is another area you should check. Ridges, bumps, or discoloration could be a sign there's a microphone hiding there. The same goes for spots on ceilings and walls, even if they're not larger than a coin. If you do find a hidden camera or something looking suspicious, don't shy away and let the hotel administration or your booking service know about it. Don't try to touch or move the device yourself. If the hotel denies everything, contact local law enforcement. After you've scanned the room for cameras, check out the mirrors. Someone could be watching you from the other side. First, see if the mirror is built into the wall or can be adjusted. If the mirror is semi-transparent, it will be built into the wall. You can do a simple test to check the mirror. Press your fingertip against the glass and push firmly enough to leave a fingerprint as you move your finger away. Study the fingerprint. If there is a small gap between the print and the mirror where the glass should be, then it's just a mirror. On a semi-transparent mirror, there will be no gap. Another way to check if your mirror is semi-transparent is simply to tap the glass. If someone is watching you from the other side, the mirror will make an empty sound. A double mirror needs a brighter light on the other side than on yours. Get close to it and cup your hands around your eyes. Do you see some light behind the mirror? If so, you might have an unwanted audience. Before you leave your room or go to bed, make sure every door is securely locked. By every door, I mean not only the entrance to the room, but also the door leading to the terrace, if you have one. You can bring a portable door lock with you for extra security if you're staying in. You could also start a little DIY project and wrap a belt or a bag strap around the arm that pushes the door shut. Buckle it up and wrap it around several times for an extra layer of protection. Another idea for when you're about to nap or go to sleep is to build a pyramid of stuff by the door. Glasses and mugs will do perfectly. If someone tries to get inside while you're sleeping, there'll be some serious noise. Intruders prefer to keep it low-key, so they're highly likely to give up on robbing you straight away. If you travel with some valuables and don't feel comfortable leaving them around the room, you could put them in the safe inside your room. But because those safes use passcodes instead of physical locks, someone from the hotel has to know the master code to unlock it, just in case. So, you can bring your own safe with you instead. You can find the ones looking like books on Amazon, for example. They're made of strong metal and textured paper. They come with a combination lock and have enough room to fit your passports, cash, and jewelry. In case you have to leave your laptop in the room and want to make sure no one plugs in a USB drive to steal your data, here's what you can do. Leave a bottle of water or some other item next to the USB port. Measure the distance. Let's say it's one thumb length away. For someone to plug in their device in the laptop, they need to move the bottle. You can take it one step further and drop a pen parallel to the laptop under a certain angle. You can measure the angle with your smartwatch or phone using the Compass app. Again, if someone moves it, you'll know. Even something as simple as a please do not disturb sign can help you figure out if someone entered your room while you were away. Make it look like you left in a rush and the sign accidentally stuck between the door and the door frame. If you come back and the sign is hanging freely, then someone must have ignored it and tried to disturb you. In that case, you can contact reception and ask to send someone to enter the room with you to keep you safe. If you care about the cleanliness of your room as much as you do about your belongings and your personal safety, this one's for you. 
Hotel housekeeping workers normally have up to 20 rooms to take care of on an 8-hour shift. It means they'll have no more than 30 minutes for your room. It gives them enough time to make the bed, clean the floors in the room and the bathroom, empty the trash bins, and dust all surfaces. But they rarely have the time to take care of smaller objects like light switches, door and drawer handles, and remotes. And yes, these are exactly the objects you'll be in contact with the most. They can actually have more germs than the toilet. So if you want to be sure those germs won't land on your hands, bring enough antibacterial wipes to clean all those things before you touch them. Been watching you when you're in the bedroom and when you're in the bathroom. No, I'm not talking about your three-year-old kids. Mm -mm. One of the last things you think about when going on vacation is if the room you're staying in has hidden cameras planted all over the place. For starters, look in the most obvious spots in your hotel room to see if you can find any hidden cameras. According to some experts, if you can't find anything in plain sight, then using your smartphone is enough for a basic sweep. Every camera has a lens, and all lenses reflect light. So a quick way to check for hidden cameras is to close all the curtains in the room and turn off the lights. Use your phone's flashlight to point it at potential places or objects a hidden camera might be at. One of the apparent spots is the smoke detector on the ceiling. Grab a chair and point the light straight at it and try to see if there's any red or blue light reflected. You'll have to do it slowly since the light needs to strike the lens at the correct angle for you to see a reflection. After you're done, move on to other objects, like the shower head in the bathroom, or an alarm clock or phone charger. Keep in mind the positions of these objects. If the charger is placed where a surveillance camera could be, then investigate it and call the reception. Even a painting in the room can be a potential nest for a hidden camera. Other objects can be lamps, a hole in the wall, or somewhere inside the closet. Another creepy place is the bathroom mirror. This one is tricky to spot, so you'll have to be patient when inspecting it. You can also use your phone camera to spot surveillance cameras that spy on you at night. These secret cameras emit infrared lights that the human eye can't see so that they can work at night. You'll also have to turn off all the lights and put the camera in selfie mode. The rear-facing camera on most smartphones has an infrared filter, but the front one doesn't. You can try pointing a TV remote at the front-facing camera and press on any of the buttons to see it yourself. If you see a bright red light on your screen, that means it's working. All you have to do is move your camera in the dark to see if you can find a bright light around. It'll be good to do a second sweep to make sure you didn't miss anything. Another technique you can use is turning off the Wi-Fi when you enter the hotel room. Most of the cameras are hooked up to the Wi-Fi, so they won't be functioning anymore. If you get a call from the reception saying that the Wi-Fi is down in the room, that might be a red flag. There's no reason for them to know if the Wi-Fi was purposely turned off. It could mean that the cameras are on the local Wi-Fi. When you connect to your hotel room Wi-Fi for the first time, be careful about sharing your personal data. Most networks will ask for your login credentials, such as your email. Some people can recreate a Wi-Fi login page that's identical to that of the actual hotel, which can be deceiving. You might be connecting to a Wi-Fi router, but an email is all it takes for some people to know everything about you. One of the best things you can do is download an app that shows you what devices are currently connected to the Wi-Fi that you're using. It can show what smartphone, laptop, smart TV, and in the worst case, hidden cameras are connected. A radio frequency scanner can detect a wireless camera in the room, even if it's connected to its own Wi-Fi. It might be challenging, though, because of many wireless devices overcrowding the airways. You can pick up random signals even if you turn off all your devices and any wireless emitting signals. Intrusion into your personal life can go so far as someone tapping your mobile phone or landline to listen to your conversations. One way of eavesdropping on people's conversations is installing a microphone to a line that sends the audio wirelessly to a recorder from a remote transmitter. Almost anyone can get their hands on such equipment since it's not too expensive to buy and is available in many shops and online. If you notice strange sounds while talking on the phone, like clicking, distant voices, or that sound similar to an old record playing, then chances are someone is listening to your phone calls. These sounds aren't typical for a regular modern cell phone. 
Most bugging software runs in the background of your phone without you knowing which drains the battery. There can be many explanations for why your phone battery keeps draining, but some software living on your phone, viruses, and malware will likely be the reason. You can also look out for unusual phone activity when you're not using your gadget. If your notifications keep popping up and you muted them, then maybe your phone is being bugged. In that case, they do not only have access to your phone calls, but your actual phone. They can fish out any picture, video, file, and information you have without you knowing it. If you try powering off your phone and it takes way longer than usual, it can be another sign of someone tracking your phone. For the phone to completely shut down, it needs to log out of all the tasks and activities properly. If your phone is transferring data to someone remotely, it might be the reason for the delay in shutting down. One of the biggest red flags is if you receive text messages that have random symbols and numbers. The ones who tap your phone use some illegal software, which sometimes requires them to receive secret codes. Make sure the text messages aren't something you subscribe to. Otherwise, contact someone who can help. If you scroll through your apps and notice something that shouldn't be there, or something that looks fishy, the app could be a disguise for a spying app. Also, check for weird history in your browsers for stuff you didn't search. You might notice your phone turning on and off randomly without you touching your phone. And worst of all, they can turn on your phone camera anytime they want without you knowing. If you feel like your phone is tampered with, then you have to factory reset everything. It wipes out all the data, including files, settings, and apps. The same risks apply to your laptop. Every now and then, we all click on something that seems legit, even though it acts as an access point for spyware to enter our computer software. Draining battery, overheating, and weird activity are telltale signs of your PC being infected. GPS trackers are the most common ways to track someone's vehicle. It's pretty simple to get the job done, but it's very difficult to find the trackers since they're usually planted deep inside the car. If you ever get the spooky feeling that someone could be watching you while you drive or, coincidentally, see the same person everywhere you drive your car, then start searching for that tracker. The most common places are underneath the car or near the back wheels. But the person tracking your car is smart and knows what they're doing. They're not going to let you find it that easily. If you find nothing on the outside of your vehicle, then try looking on the inside. If you find something there, it's a clear sign the person tracking you broke into your car and planted the tracking device. Or it could be someone you know who took a ride with you once and slipped it in without you knowing. Check behind the dashboard and within your car's electronics to be sure. Instead of ripping your car apart to find the tracker, you can buy a GPS bug detector. They work by finding electronic frequencies in your car's proximity. They won't block it from tracking you down, but they'll help you find it. Before using it, turn off your smartphone or put it in airplane mode. This way, the frequencies won't intercept with the tracking device. And if you feel like this isn't working, try parking your car in a remote area where nothing is in sight. Even a remote garage would do. Well, anyone else feeling a little paranoid? Let's see some hands. Well, well, you're planning a holiday with your friends, but this is going to be one of the most unique adventures you've ever undertaken. And not because of your destination. It's the hotel you're going to stay at. You are choosing one of the most incredible hotels in the world. The Dolce by Wyndham. Vietnam's capital city of Hanoi may seem like your typical concrete landscape. However, located in the center of the city by Giang Vo Lake, you'll find a majestic golden tower 25 stories high. It may seem like a palace for royalty, but it's a 5-star hotel with over 400 guest rooms. Almost 54,000 square feet of gilded ceramic was used to create the exterior of this golden monument. If you were to lay out the entire length of that gold in a straight line, it would reach up higher than most airplanes fly. The Dolce by Wyndham Hanoi Golden Lake opened in July 2020 after 11 years of construction and a cost of $200 million. It's been touted as the world's first gold-plated hotel, with one ton of 24-karat gold used to decorate it. As you're welcomed through the hotel's handcrafted golden gates, you'll find even more gold in the wall decorations and gold-plated ceilings of the lobby. The hotel's golden elevators will take you to your room, 
where the suites also have decorative gold features in the walls and ceilings. There's yet even more gold to discover in the bathroom, where you can bathe in a golden bathtub or walk-in shower and brush your teeth at a golden basin. Not enough gold for you? Well, even the toilet is coated in gold. The hotel's 200-square-foot rooftop infinity pool also has 24-karat gilded tiles and mosaics, offering a panoramic view of the city. Still haven't had your fill of gold, Mr. Goldfinger? You'll also find gold on the hotel's menu, with meals covered in edible gold flakes. I bet you've never had golden steak before. You're probably feeling like royalty just hearing about this place. But you don't have to be a Hollywood movie star to stay in one of the hotel's luxurious gold-decorated rooms. A night at the Dolce is surprisingly affordable, as the hotel owners want to welcome all guests to stay the night. Due to all the gold being locally sourced, the owners were able to keep construction costs down and are now able to offer affordable rooms. Ice Hotel Sweden Now here's one to cool your head. From a hotel made out of gold, we're going to one made out of ice. Sweden's Ice Hotel is rebuilt every year in the village of Jakasjarvi, so you'll never experience the same chilly stay twice. Located in northern Sweden above the Arctic Circle, the hotel is designed by multiple artists who implement unique designs each season, from December to April, and the process takes roughly six weeks to complete. The story of the Ice Hotel began in 1989, when visitors of Jekas Jarvi asked to spend the night in an igloo, which was part of an ice-themed art exhibition when they failed to secure accommodation in the village. Everything in the hotel is made of ice, including beds, chairs, and even the glasses in the bar. It's not the latest rage from Ikea, however. The ice and snow are all sourced locally from the Torn River close to the village. Food is served on blocks of ice at the hotel's restaurants, and you can even have an ice-themed wedding. The ever-changing hotel is the first of its kind, inspiring other such ice-made hotels. The temperature inside hovers at a frosty constant of 23 to 19 degrees Fahrenheit. Nah, don't worry, you won't freeze. The hotel provides you with expedition-style thermal sleeping bags to keep you warm at night. You'll also undertake a survival course to help you adapt to your chilly stay. Though the hotel itself is icy, the welcome is warm, and it remains one of the most popular accommodations in Sweden. Henna Hotel Well, it may not be Jurassic Park, but the Henna Hotel in Nagasaki, Japan, still has dinosaurs. Well, robot dinosaurs. The hotel's robot staff isn't exclusively dinosaurs, though. And yes, you heard that right, the bulk of the hotel's employees are robots. Yet another first on this list, the Henna boasts that it's the first robot-operated hotel in the world. At reception, you'll be greeted by either a humanoid robot or a velociraptor sporting a bow tie, bellman's cap, and an American accent. Once checked in, a porter robot will carry your luggage to your room, and a concierge robot will be available to provide information on the hotel services. You'll also have an adorable robot assistant in your room to switch on lights and offer weather forecasts. Another unique feature of this hotel is its facial recognition technology, rendering key cards a thing of the past. At least you don't have to worry about being locked out of your room. Hen Na translates as strange hotel, which perfectly defines this quirky addition to our list. Unfortunately, since its opening, the Hen Na Hotel has had to fire up to half of its 243 robot staff as they proved to be not so efficient at their job. Some guests reported being woken up by their robot hosts during the night and sometimes being greeted by an unresponsive stare at reception. Imagine being woken in the middle of the night by a robotic velociraptor in a bow tie and hat. Woohoo! While some robots have been left out of the job, the hotel still maintains half its robotic staff. The Boot Have you ever heard of the older woman who lived in a shoe? Well, now you can experience life inside footwear for yourself, at least for a night. This hidden gem is nestled in a fantasy-like chestnut grove on New Zealand's South Island, a bed and breakfast that looks like something straight out of a nursery rhyme. Unlike previous additions to our list, the boot only accommodates two guests at a time but promises a cozy stay. The comfortable cottage lives up to its name, shaped like a giant boot with windows and a front door. The interior is just as quaint, with a hospitable living area located at the toe of the boot. It's equipped with a fireplace and a spiral staircase leading up to the bedroom. 
There's no modern technology to be found here. However, this is meant for a quiet, romantic retreat with books and candles. So, no TV or internet. Now, luckily, the boot comes free of a giant's foot odor. Though we're pretty sure giants in New Zealand are extinct anyway, so you don't have to worry about a giant foot trying to step on you while you sleep. So relax. Espeo de Luna What better place could be to hang up your adventurer's boots than in the belly of a wrecked ship? Or how about a hotel that looks like one? Located on the island of Chiloé in Chile, the Espeo de Luna's unique lodges are spaced out in the island's woods and built like houses fit for Caribbean pirates. Chiloé is well known for its call of adventure and wildlife. Surrounded by small islands to explore and lookouts for spotting rare dolphins and whales, the reception building is an immediate eye-catcher, appearing as an old wooden ship washed ashore and turned onto its side. The restaurant and bar will make you feel like you're on the forecastle of a 1700s ship adorned with a classic ship's figurehead. Feel free to lean over the side and shout, Ahoy there, mateys! to your fellow guests. Chile's long maritime tradition inspired the theme and style of this unique lodging, and it serves as the perfect stay for adventurers. Spitbank Fort If your heart's still at sea, then this next one is for ye, I mean you. Built near Portsmouth, England in the 1860s as a deterrent for unwelcome intruders, this former sea fort has been retrofitted as one of the unique luxury hotels in the world. Flying into Spitbank Fort by helicopter will feel like something from an action movie. Complete with nine suites, three bars, three restaurants, and spa facilities, Spitbank has plenty of relaxation to offer its guests. If adventure is more to your liking, you can explore the waters of the English Channel in a kayak or on a fishing trip. With ocean views from every room, the rooftop is the main attraction, where you can take in 360 degrees sea views by the fire pit or in the hotel's heated pool. Spitbank maintains its historic integrity with long-lasting features, like metal tracking where the cannons were set and iron hooks in the walls where the hammocks once hung. That's just six mind-boggling and unique hotels you can stay at around the world. So, what incredible hotel experience have you ever had? Airports are some of the most visited and, at the same time, mysterious places out there. So, let's see what's going on behind the scenes and what secrets airports hide. At some airports, there are special people called profilers. Such people bring to life a special program called SPOT, Screening Passengers by Observation Technique. They analyze your mimics, gestures, and behavior in order to detect suspicious people. Their job is to notice nonverbal signs of anxiety, people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in an unusual way, they can invite them for an inspection. There, they talk to this person trying to find out more about them and confirm, or not, their suspicions. Airport agents might also be watching you all the way from the security check to your gate. Some airports have facial recognition scanners that can easily track you. They're equipped with special software that compares passengers' faces with their IDs. Keep in mind that if you don't charge your laptop before the flight, it may be confiscated. It's not uncommon for an airport security officer to ask you to power your device up. If you fail to do it, your gadget can be taken away for an additional check. For safety reasons, it's crucial to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with or modified in a way that can cause harm during the flight. Packing an electric brush in your check-in luggage may land you in trouble. Brushes produced by some brands have lithium batteries inside, and those can potentially lead to serious problems in the air. That's why leaving your electric brush in your check suitcase isn't an option. But you're allowed to store them in your carry-on bag. At the same time, if your device runs on AA batteries, you can put it wherever you want. Anyone who's ever traveled by plane knows about the no liquids rule, but not everybody knows that this rule also applies to peanut butter, toothpaste, creams, lotions, liquid makeup, lava lamps, snow globes, some kinds of medications, deodorant, and even gel shoe inserts. Now, let's go outside for a while and look at those landing spots. Airports charge airline companies huge fees for landing on their runways on certain days and at particular times. 
But the most interesting thing is that the landing spots can be bought and sold. For example, in 2016, Oman Air paid Air France around $75 million for one early morning arrival slot at London Heathrow Airport. You must have noticed that airfare has increased over the past decade. That's because of the extremely high prices of landing slots. Dispatchers don't only control the planes in the sky, as you can often see in the movies, but they also look after their movements on the ground. They also control the lighting on the runways. There's three types of air traffic controllers, en route, terminal, and tower. Each of these dispatchers has their own area of responsibility. One dispatcher has about five monitors, and the information on them is constantly changing since the monitors show weather conditions and information about other planes. You know how it sometimes goes. You come to a security checkpoint, and all of a sudden, it turns out you have something prohibited in your carry-on. But worry not, you still have a chance to save your favorite pen knife. At some airports, there are on-site postal services, and you might have an opportunity to mail your belongings to any address you provide. But the mailing fees are pretty high. Plus, certain items are prohibited, and the postal service won't deliver them. Airports can be selling your lost luggage right now. Of course, I don't say that there's no chance for you to get back your suitcases that's traveled to a different destination, but just as likely, you might not see it again. In this case, an airport has the right to sell your misplaced belongings at an auction. Most airports have an annual lost luggage sale. After paying an entry fee, you can bid on electronics, clothes, bags, and other stuff. While flying, you might have a celebrity on board, but you won't know it. Large airports have separate check-in and security procedures for celebrities. They often board the plane directly through a hidden door located beside the jet bridge. Some airlines also use cool cars to transfer VIP passengers from the terminal building to the plane. At the same time, most people come to the airport well ahead of time. And the most popular activity while waiting for a flight is wandering through the duty-free zone. And even though people rarely plan to buy anything there, different products end up in their shopping baskets. That's because lots of airports are designed in a special way that makes people feel relaxed and at ease. I'm talking about all those huge windows, a lot of light, massage chairs, and comfortable seating areas. And statistically, calm passengers are 10% more likely to spend money on retail, duty-free, and food. Designers put a lot of thought into airport layouts. It helps to ensure the smooth flow of travelers. And the main point here is easy navigation that can prevent people from getting lost. This is achieved through subtle but very effective design cues. And placing duty-free zones between security checkpoints and boarding gates is one of them. They supposedly help you relax after clearing security and lead you where you need to go. But speaking of food, a celebrity chef restaurant at the airport might not be as good as it would be if you were visiting the real thing. Not chefs themselves, but special restaurant companies are responsible for airport outlets. One of the reasons is the extremely strict security that surrounds airport deliveries, including food. You may still have a nice meal, but it won't be the same. Now, I'll tell you about one more way airports manipulate you into spending your money. They make you walk through the shiny duty-free stores straight after the security check. But the most curious thing is that the walkway through such stores usually veers to the left. That's done because most people are right-handed, which means they use their right arm to pull their luggage and are more likely to look to the right while passing through the stores. And the duty-free zone veering to the left leaves more space on the right where passengers are more likely to look. Oh, and have you ever noticed how many mirrors there are at airports? Mirrors are strategically placed there to make airports appear larger and create an illusion of more space. This in turn helps to reduce the feeling of claustrophobia and makes the airport experience more comfortable for travelers. If you have an opportunity, don't exchange cash at the airport. You'll never get a good rate there. Those who didn't buy local currency in advance can instead order it online and collect it at the airport. 
Some services only need a few hours' notice for such an order. Or it might even be better to use an ATM to withdraw some cash at your final destination. Now, have you ever paid attention to airport codes? The most often used are three-letter codes. Why this number? Back in the 1930s in the USA, pilots used the National Weather Service's two-letter city codes to refer to airports. But soon, the number of airports in the country outgrew the number of such codes. That's why airlines expanded this system by adding the third letter. It was usually X. That's how LA, Los Angeles, turned into LAX. But even though there shouldn't be two airports with the same code, some of these codes sound so similar you can easily mistake one for the other. For example, look at this airport with the code CGP in Bangladesh. And here we have CPG. It's the code of an airport in Argentina. It's dangerously easy to fly to the wrong place, so pay attention. Many airports have carpets at their gate areas. This nicety usually comes with a few other perks. Lower ceilings, comfortable seats, and pleasant natural lighting. All this costs more for airports, and carpets are not so easy to clean as hard floors are. But they create a cozy feeling for passengers waiting for their flight, making them more relaxed. Still, it isn't a gesture of goodwill on the part of airports. According to social research, calm passengers are about 7 to 10 percent more likely to go window shopping and actually buy something in the lounge area or duty-free zone. So, by investing in the passenger's comfort, airports actually increase their own income. If you ever wanted to know what happened to your baggage while you're on board a plane, the short answer is that airport staff don't actually know once it leaves their territory, and they probably really don't care. Sorry. Baggage is sorted automatically. Scanners scan the barcode and sort the baggage according to its destination. The three main tasks of airport baggage handlers are to move your bags from the check-in area to the gate, to move them from one gate to another when you have a connection, and to move your bags from the plane to the baggage claim area. And that's it. So if your luggage doesn't move fast enough, it can be late for your connecting flight, or the exact opposite. Your bag gets to your destination before you do because you're stuck at passport control. Another problem can arise if you forget to tear off any old stickers showing a different destination. In this case, the scanner might send your luggage to the wrong country. Most airports are equipped with giant kitchens where the food for passengers is prepared. These kitchens usually cook food for different airlines at once. And since that oh-so-delightful airplane food must be cooked for about 6 to 10 hours in advance, these kitchens have to work 24-7. And however surprising it might sound, the menu for your flight is developed up to a year in advance. This is a common practice for most airlines because every single ingredient matters and adds to expenses. In fact, one airline managed to save $40,000 after they removed just one olive from every salad they served on their flights. Airport staff sometimes ask passengers to rub their hands on a piece of cloth before putting it into a special machine. It might seem kind of scary, but it's actually harmless. You're simply being checked by a machine called an atomizer. Before their working day starts, employees put samples of dangerous chemicals into the machine. The machine memorizes these smells, and in case a person's hand smells like those chemicals, it alerts airport staff to this danger. You know how it sometimes goes. You come to the security checkpoint, and suddenly, it turns out you have something prohibited to take on board in your carry-on. But don't worry, all the things seized during the pre-flight inspection can be stored at the airport for as long as three months. On top of that, you have an opportunity to mail them any address inside the country. Things taken away by security and weren't claimed can also get sold at special auctions and are delivered worldwide. If you have a long layover between flights, going to the nearest hotel to rest might not be the cheapest option. There's a much better trick. Check if the airport or airline sells 24-hour access to the VIP lounge zone. In most cases, you can have free snacks and drinks there and use free shower cabins and rooms for rest at a very affordable price. In multi-terminal airports, search for underground passageways connecting terminals that most people might not know about. For example, at Frankfurt Airport in Germany, there's a walking tunnel between Terminal 1 and Terminal 2 that's mostly used by employees since passengers are simply unaware of its existence. There's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you clear check-in. 
The golden hour. It's the time that passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Let's admit, sitting in front of a comfy chair while looking at a flashy sign or shopping window can be tempting. And that's exactly what the airports want you to feel. If your flight is overbooked and you can't fly at the designated time, don't hurry to accept the first voucher you're offered as an apology. Normally, airlines keep raising the stakes until they have enough volunteers to give up their flight seats. And if they don't and you've been bumped in voluntarily, you can insist on a cash refund instead. Depending on your ticket price and the time of your delay, you might be entitled to as much as $1,300. Most airports have specific experts called profilers. These people practice what's called SPOT, or the Screening Passengers by Observation Technique. They carefully analyze facial expressions, gestures, and behavior in order to detect suspicious people. Their job is to notice the nonverbal signs of anxiety, such as people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in a weird or off way, they can invite them for an inspection, where they can talk to a person to find out more about them. Profilers work in both the main halls and in passport control. The typical question they ask is, what's the purpose of your visit? Then they check the person's reaction to this inquiry. No matter how reserved a passenger is, if they have something to hide, TSA officers will find out, thanks to the tiniest cues in people's behavior. Before your luggage even gets on the plane, it goes through five security levels, and one of them, besides scanning the contents, includes being checked by a special dog that can sniff out dangerous chemicals. It's a well-known fact that a dog's nose is much stronger than that of any human. In fact, dogs distinguish smells from 10,000 to 100,000 times better than people do. No wonder airports take advantage of this super sense for security and regularly use these sniffer dogs to detect suspicious substances. What's really cool is that you can't even distinguish a detection dog from its civilian siblings. Unlike police dogs, the ones working at airports aren't trained to frighten or intimidate people. The most popular sniffer breeds are Golden Retrievers, Labs, and German Short-Haired Pointers. Charging your phone at a specifically designated spot can look convenient, but it's not really safe. If the charging station only allows you to plug in your cord, you might get malware installed on your phone with you none the wiser. The only safe way to charge your phone or tablet is to find an electric socket and use it with your own charger. Same goes for free airport Wi-Fi. Apart from the airports requiring you to authenticate yourself more often than not, someone can easily access your data while you're using an unprotected Wi-Fi hotspot. It's safer to use your mobile data, but if you absolutely have to use the airport's Wi-Fi, best clear or encrypt all your important data on your device. It might be exasperating to take your laptop out of your carry-on at the security check every single time. But the airport staff need to have a clear look at your device to make sure nothing is concealed inside. On the screen of an x-ray scanner, a laptop looks like a semi-transparent object with a clearly visible hard drive, CD drive, and whatnot. But security officers can't see what's behind some of those parts. For example, a dense and rather large battery. People tend to choose the closest security line to them. If that line turns out to be super crowded, just look around after ID and ticket check. You may see another checkpoint with much fewer people. Some checkpoints at the airport are situated at the far edges of the terminal, and that's why passengers fail to notice them. Applying for a TSA pre-check can be a great time saver for traveling in and out of the U.S. Being a member of this program has some great perks. First, getting through security and passport control happens faster. If you're a pre-check traveler, you won't have to take off your shoes or remove your belt, and forget about placing your stuff like liquids and laptops in special bins. If you aren't flying to or from the U.S., then you can look up similar services available in your country. If you're flying economy class but don't like it, who does? Check in online and check out the seating options about four days before your flight. It's about that time that airlines typically start upgrading seats, and you might get an upgrade to business class for a small fee or even sometimes for free. You can also ask for an upgrade when you're already at the airport. Most people forget about this opportunity or simply don't care, so you might just get lucky.
A lot of airports are built near water, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for this. First off, most airports are located in big cities, and big cities are usually built near some form of water anyway. Back in the day, before trucks and proper roads were built, goods were transported by ship. Having a river or ocean nearby was vital to deliver essential supplies to the cities, like food and building supplies. It also allowed for trading to boost the local economies. Because most people travel into big cities for business and holidays, rather than rural areas, it made sense to build the airports there. The high demand for travel meant that the airports were needed and also made them profitable. But that's not the only reason they're built near water. Big cities are usually super crowded, and airports require a lot of land. Imagine trying to find a space big enough in the middle of New York City to put an airport. It would be basically impossible. Areas next to water are usually a bit more rural, so there's more space than the big cities filled with skyscrapers. Some countries have even taken this one step further. Land is really scarce in Japan, so to build Kansai International Airport, the architects of Osaka headed three miles offshore to Osaka Bay to make a man-made island. The artificial island is 13,200 feet long and 8,500 feet wide. That's so big that it can even be seen from space. It took a whopping 38 months to complete, and travelers can get across to the main island of Honshu via car, railroad, or high-speed ferry. Kansai International Airport opened in 1994 and became the world's first airport to be built on the sea. Despite its location, it has the longest airport terminal in the world with a length of just under one mile. Airplanes also can't have any obstacles around them when landing. It would be really difficult to try landing a plane with obstructions. These include trees, mountains, buildings, and power lines. Over water, nothing will restrict planes from taking off or landing making it much safer. On mountainous islands, runways are often parallel to the ocean, as the mountains are inland, just like in the Grand Canaria Airport, located on one of the Canary Islands. It also links to safety reasons. If a plane has to cancel a runway landing and go back around again, there must be enough room for it to do this safely without hitting anything. It's also got to be able to climb back up into the air at a safe angle to avoid causing problems for the passengers inside. Reaching this safe altitude is much easier, quicker, and safer by the sea, compared to big cities or mountainous areas. Speaking of failed landings, pilots are trained to deal with engine failure on takeoff. If a plane reaches the right speed for takeoff, it has to leave the runway, even if the engine fails. But don't worry, planes can still fly with only one engine, it just requires a bit more effort. Because of the reduced capacity, it takes longer to reach the right altitude, and more space is required for takeoff. Taking off towards the ocean makes it easier to climb to a safe altitude without worrying about colliding with any obstacles. Another reason for airports being built at water level is that the higher up we go, the thinner the air becomes. It causes the thrust of the engines to decrease, as well as the lift produced by the wings. Setting off from higher areas means it's more difficult for the planes to take off. In terms of money, this would mean building longer runways, which would cost more, and no one wants that. This also means the planes require less fuel as they don't burn as much energy on takeoff. And there's less noise made as the planes don't have to work as hard. But despite this making the planes less noisy, airports are going to have pretty high noise levels. Imagine hearing planes zooming over your house while you're trying to get sleep at night. This is a key reason why airports are usually built on the coast far away from any residential areas, as fish aren't generally known to file noise complaints. In some countries, airports actually have to provide upgrades for nearby houses that will be affected by the noise. Germany is one of these countries, and they do everything from improving roofs to adding wall insulation to cover all that noise. Building by the coast means that they don't have to pay up for all these expensive upgrades, which saves the airport lots of cash. Coastal areas also have weather advantages for flying. Sea breezes are steady winds that blow from the water to the land. Planes mostly land and take off with the wind, making it the perfect place to build an airport as there'll be no delays caused by unexpected strong winds. But while the sea breezes that come in spring and summer are great, Areas near water can be prone to fog during fall and winter, so this part has its pros and cons. But not every airport is on the coast, as it does also pose a number of issues too. 
One of the biggest is birds. Our feathered friends love the coast because of all the yummy fish, but they can cause big problems for pilots. But airports manage to get around this using scare tactics. Birds don't really enjoy noise, and planes aren't the quietest of things. Airports also make loud bangs and even train hawks to take down birds that are in the way. The most obvious risk of building close to the sea, though, is flooding. Airports cost crazy amounts of money to build, and planes aren't cheap either. Back in 2018, Kansai Airport was flooded by Typhoon Jebi. They had to cancel all operations for two days, and the water was so high that it damaged the engines of the planes. While coastal airports put measures in place to protect against flooding, it's pretty difficult to save everything from a typhoon. With rising sea levels and an increase in extreme weather, these floodings are also looking more and more likely to happen. A quarter of the world's 100 busiest airports are less than 32 feet above sea level. And 12 of those, including New York, San Francisco, and Shanghai, are less than 16 feet. Yikes! All that water poses another problem. If planes overshoot the runway, they have nowhere to go. Overshooting is basically when the pilot underestimates the length of the runway and doesn't reach takeoff speed in time. There are usually extra bits of concrete or grass that the plane can run onto when the airports are on land. There'd be a bit of damage to the plane in this case, but nothing major. But with coastal airports, the plane might go straight into the water. Luckily, there's new tech that aims to prevent this from happening. These new kits let the pilots enter in all the flight calculations, including the weather conditions that could affect takeoff. This system then calculates how much runway the plane will need to stop. Many airports also have added soft concrete to the end of runways to avoid a watery disaster. When the plane glides onto this soft concrete, they get stuck and it stops them traveling too far. There are also financial issues with building airports next to the water. Land rent next to the coast or lakes is usually higher than the mainland due to the demand. Like 40% of the US population lives on the coast, despite coastal areas only making up around 10% of America's total landmass. Airports require flat land to be built on, but this isn't always easy to find, and coastal land can pose particular problems due to sand conditions on marshland. But this doesn't mean it's not possible. One of the world's most famous airports, New York's JFK, was built on marshland. The land was a lot cheaper than usual, and marshland can't really be used for a lot. Of course, it can cost a lot of money to make the ground suitable to carry heavy loads, but this was all sorted. Finding such a big area close to one of the world's most famous cities was a very rare find, even if it was marshland. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends.